Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the service this morning, and a special thank you to Walter for coming and taking the service and your family as well. It's good to see you. Um, there's a little bit of a change today. We had an emergency phone call Friday afternoon. John Bishop was due to take a reading service this evening, but he was phoning up from hospital. He's been taken with a suspected heart attack. So, afraid you got me instead of John Bishop. And the sermon I prepared for the next Sunday evening is now Sunday evening. Thankfully, I was actually sat in my study at the time, sorting it out, thinking I was going to be ahead of myself. It didn't quite work out like that. Uh, Bible study this week on Tuesday, Andrew at 7.30, and the coffee morning on Wednesday. Obviously, no clubs now because the schools are broken up for the school holidays. Uh, next Sunday morning, we've got Derek French in the morning, and um, me again in the evening. Your prayers, obviously, if you look at the back of the note sheets you've got there, let's continue to revere Jackie and her family, especially at this time. And also, various other people in the church are connections to us for health issues. Let's support one another, let's pray for one another as a church. And also, remember the Open Air Mission. They'll be attending the next two weeks of the Beach Mission. And following that, they'll be working away with the week after that. So let's remember them and their work. And other Beach Missions, Holiday Cubs, capped on this summer period because it's a great form of outreach, isn't it? So let's pray for God's blessing upon that also. And also, let's remember those two, those are away on holiday, pray that refreshing time, uh, change the scenery, and they'll come back physically and spiritually encouraged. Thank you very much, Walter. Thank you, Walter. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's lovely, as always, to be with you. Good to see each one of you. And uh, thank you for your welcome and for your invitation, indeed. Um, but uh, let's just. Uh, Remind ourselves what we've come together for. We've come together to worship the living God, haven't we? And uh, we're going to continue with that now by singing our first hymn, number 625. Oh my soul, arise and bless your maker. He is your master and your friend. Slow to wrath, rich in tender mercy. Worship the Saviour, Jesus. <laughs>
as he sees me face to face. Well, we're going to turn to God's word in a moment, but um, I wonder if any of you have ever played the game Simon Says. Simon Says. You all know the game, I'm sure, where someone stands up and they say, Simon Says, I don't know, scratch your nose and you all have to do it. Or Simon Says, pull your ear and you all have to do it. And then they'll slip in something which Simon didn't say. They'll just say, maybe they said, Simon said, put your hand up, and then they'll say, put your hand down. And if you do it, you're out. You're out. And uh, we come together, don't we, on a Sunday morning, and uh, we come to hear and obey what a particular person says. What a particular person says. And we all know, it's not me, it's not Russell when he's here, or whoever else is standing here. That's not who you have to obey. Because what we are here to do is to say to you, to the best of our ability, what Jesus says, what God says through his word. And those are the things we're to listen out for. You know, preachers, elders, pastors. You know, I'll give you a little secret. Perhaps I shouldn't tell you this. They're not perfect, okay? They're not perfect. They're people of faults like yourself. They're good people, God-fearing people, but not perfect. So we have to be careful, and we have to listen carefully to what's being said. What we want to hear is what God says. That's what we have to do. You see, we're here not just to listen, we're here to be affected. But we're here to be affected and to do what God says. So listen carefully. When the word's read, hear what God's saying. And when I'm speaking, or whoever is speaking to you on any particular day, you need to listen carefully. You see, we're very influenced as people by what other people do and say. You know, um, even the great Apostle Paul, you know, he wasn't perfect. He wasn't perfect. He said to the Corinthians, he said to them, imitate me. But he didn't just say imitate me. He qualified it. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So you've got good examples here in your church. And hopefully the people who come and speak to you each Sunday from outside also are good examples to you. But they're not perfect. So listen to them carefully. You know, the Berean people, we're told, in the Acts of the Apostles, the great Apostle Paul came and spoke to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. What did they do? They went away, and they looked into the scriptures for themselves to see whether it was right. What a great example that is, isn't it, to each one of us. I hope you do that on a Sunday, week by week, as the words read to you, as the words preached to you. I hope you go away and look into it for yourselves, you know, because preachers are not perfect people. They're not perfect people. You need to seek God for yourself about the things that are being said and discern what is God saying through all this. So uh, that's my word to you this morning, my first word to you. Um, you know, we're here to discern what God's saying. But let's hear what he has to say to us through his word this morning by reading from Romans chapter 12. <coughs> short chapter, I'm going to read the whole chapter, Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then, Gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Give prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. 
Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honour giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God's word to us this morning. Let's continue in worship by singing hymn number 493. 493 in the hymn books. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure.
Lord, you do. You came to save sinners. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful love, for your wonderful care, selflessness, and sacrifice, through which we come to the throne of grace this morning, cleansed by your blood. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we have no other plea save for your blood that was shed for me and for each one of us. Lord, we come to you, God of all the earth, creator of heavens and the earth, God of all power, all love, all knowledge, all wisdom, and all grace. Lord, we come to thank you and praise you for the many ways in which you bless us. Lord, we come to thank you and praise you for all the good things we enjoy in this life. We come to thank you and praise you for the wonderful promises which are yet to come, but of which we can be sure and convinced. Lord, we come too with concerns of our hearts. Lord, we uh, come to lift up before you this fellowship here. Lord, for each one which you have placed in this place, Lord, to worship here as a part of your family here. Lord, you know each and every one's circumstances. Lord, we thank you for those who are on good times. Bless those who are away enjoying their holidays. You know too, Lord, and care about those who are struggling. Lord, whether it be with health, Lord, with circumstantial issues, or spiritually. And Lord, you care about each one. We just lift them to you, Lord, and pray that you would meet with each one of us this morning, according to our own particular needs. Lord, we do pray for that man who was due to be speaking here this evening. Lord, your servant, I pray that you'll be with him. We pray for his healing. Strengthening, Lord, that you might uh, yet, Lord, return him to serving you. Lord, by sharing your word. Lord, we just lift that man to you and his family too. Pray you'll give them peace at this time. Pray for those, Lord, in this fellowship and uh, others that we know who are suffering. And uh, we know that the uh, COVID virus is still rife in our land. And we do pray, Lord, for each one who may be suffering with it at this time, that you would restore them and strengthen them. Thank you, Lord, that you have restored to us a great measure of freedom to come together in this way to worship you. Lord, it's so true of us that we don't realise sometimes what we have until it's taken away. And during the strictest lockdowns, Lord, we uh, miss so much the gathering together with your people. So thank you that you've restored that to us. Pray you would help us not to take it for granted, but Lord, to treat it as a privilege it is. But we do pray for each one who is still suffering, Lord, with this virus. Lord, thank you for the good news of people restored. Thank you that you protected our brother, Lord, in an accident recently, and uh, you're restoring him. And uh, we just praise you for the way you watch over your people and help us, Lord. Lord, I do pray for the witness that goes out from this fellowship. Heavenly Father, that you will bless it and empower it. Lord, and use it. Lord, whether it be in the uh, young people, Lord, or people of any age, we, we just long to see your gospel go out, Lord, and bear fruit. So please help those who are involved in any form of ministry, Lord. And please uphold them, strengthen them, encourage them, energize them, equip them. Lord, and use them, I pray, to your glory. Bless the work of this church, I pray. Lord, we do think of other churches meeting around this land. Thank you for the FIC, Lord, cluster to which we belong. Um, we pray for all the other churches that you will bless them and help them. Lord, uphold those and encourage those who are struggling. And uh, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would Continue to bless the faithful ministry of your word, Lord, wherever it may take place. Lord, we do pray for our land. And Lord, we do 
seem to be in turmoil in so many ways. Lord, we lift to you the political situation and we pray again that you will bring order from chaos. Pray that you will bring stability to our land. Lord, when your people went into exile, you told them to pray for the peace and the prosperity of the land they were in. Because within that lies their peace and prosperity. And we do pray, Lord, in the same way for our land. Because within its peace, Lord, and stability lies ours too. And our freedom to come together to worship you. So we do pray, Lord, that you will bring peace, prosperity, and stability to our land. Lord, whoever you choose to put into power, we pray that you would use them for your glory. And we know, Lord, you can use anyone. Lord, do continue to remember the Ukraine. It goes off the news to a great degree to, to what it used to be, but there's still so much uh, suffering and uh, destruction and pain going on there. Lord, we do lift that land to you pray again, Lord, that you would, intervene, you would intervene in the affairs of man and uh, bring an end, Lord, to the war and the killing and the destruction. Pray for each one who's been displaced and lost everything. Oh, Lord, please, uh, I pray that they would look to you and that you would help them. Bless your people who are trying to minister to one another in such situations. Lord, we know we live in a fallen world, and it uh, shows its, the evidence of it is everywhere around us. But Lord, we do lift it to you. Lord, and pray that we as your people, Lord, worldwide, not just here, but all across the land and across the world, would be salt and light. Lord, the salt and savour that's so desperately needed in this world, we pray that your people supply it. Lord, grant your gospel success, I pray, across the world. Be with suffering Christians, persecuted Christians, Lord, in lands where it's difficult to openly profess faith in you, where it can even be in danger, where it can even endanger life. Give them courage, give them strength, give them wisdom. I pray that you would, uh, Lord, grant your gospel success even in the most difficult lands. So we do lift to you, each and every one, Lord God. We do remember the beach missions, as has already been mentioned, that are taking place, Lord, in all the holiday clubs and different things which have taken place in your name in the coming weeks. Lord God, please add your blessing to them. Please use them, I pray. Lord, there are many people who have testified to having been saved at such events in years gone by and we pray that that will continue lord that you would add lord your blessing to the ministry in that way lord even in the simple way in the games and the fun that are based on your word i pray that you would speak to young hearts old hearts any hearts lord through these coming weeks and the various missions which take place so we lift these things to you and lord for, to you, and lord, for ourselves now as we shortly Go to uh, meditate on a portion of your word, Lord. We pray that you would speak. Pray you would help us to discern your voice. Make us willing, Lord, to obey what you say. Lord, in advance, I, I ask you to bless that which is right in your sight and to forgive that which is wrong. But Lord, we all, on behalf of everyone here, I pray that by your spirit you would minister to us this morning and do us good because we ask it in Jesus name and for his sake. Amen. Before we do look into God's word we're going to sing one more time number 647 in Christ alone my hope is found. 647. <coughs>
brought into a relationship. Aren't we? First of all, and foremost, a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. You know, we become, as Paul says in chapter 8, we become adopted. We, we're given a spirit of adoption by which we can cry out, Abba, Father, by which we can call God our Father. And each and every one of us who have come to Christ now have God as our Father, as our Heavenly Father. So that makes us, as we often call each other, brothers and sisters. Not blood brothers and sisters, but brothers and sisters in the faith. We're family. Family. And we're inextricably bound together, aren't we? Both with God and with each other. And uh, in this chapter, the Apostle Paul describes it as being a body. As being a body. We're each having a different part to play, and that's quite right. And other places, you know, the image is that of a family. Uh, but the fact is, we're inextricably linked. We're very closely linked. It's about relationship, isn't it? Our faith is all about relationships. Again, first and foremost with God himself, but also with each other. And not only that, but also with the rest of the world. It's about relationship. And uh, this chapter is about, from verse 9 onwards especially, what that looks like. It's about what that looks like, isn't it? But what is it, uh, what is the driving force behind all these things? Well, the driving force behind all these things is love. You know, that is, God himself is love. And he so loved us that he sent his only son. That whoever believes on him shouldn't perish but have an eternal life. And our response is love. That's the only proper response to God's love for us. It's love, first and foremost, for God, but also for each other. And also for the rest of the world. Like God loves the rest of the world, we're to love them too. So it's the driving force is love. You know, in our own physical lives, the driving force in our bodies is our heart, isn't it? It's the heart. And the heart of the Christian faith is love. But as in our physical bodies, you know, there are things which can damage our heart. And we can think of many of them. You know, it's... Uh, High cholesterol, stress, blood pressure, a bad diet, whatever it might be, lack of exercise, you know. So, in the Christian life, we're driven by love. By God's love for us and our love in response to his love for us. But there are things, if that's the driving part, there are things which can knock it, aren't there? But things which can reduce it. Things which we have to guard against. And I think many of them are found in the short verse 12. You know, I think this is the heart, really. Um, these are things which need to be taken care of that we would have a good and healthy spiritual heart. Verse 12, Paul encourages the Christians because a lot of what he's saying in verse 9 onwards is about relationships, our relationships with each other and our relationship with the rest of the world. But this verse 12 really is about our relationship with God. Because our relationship with God depends on how we will be able to carry out these three instructions here. And carrying out these three instructions here will also affect our relationship with God. So the Apostle is encouraging the people in Rome to be a rejoicing people, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, and continuing steadfastly in prayer. And these things are vital, I think, for a healthy spiritual life, for our relationship with God to be good, and from that springs our relationship with everyone else. So we're going to look at these vital indicators this morning. Um, and first of all, rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope, the Apostle says. I wonder what hope means to you. I wonder what kind of things you hope for, in a natural sense. You know, things we hope for are things which we would like to come about, aren't they? When we normally talk of hope, there are things we'd like to come about, but they may or may not actually happen. You know, and, uh, again, I don't know what you hope for, whether you are hoping for good health, or better health, or whether you're hoping for wealth, or a successful career, or to do well in your education, whether you're hoping for better weather tomorrow than today, you know, whether you're hoping for world peace, political stability, whether you're hoping that your football team will have a better season this year than last year, I don't know what you hope for. But whatever it is, I pray that God might bless you, might bring a 
those homes to fruition. And if he does, that will be a cause for rejoicing, won't it? That will be a cause for rejoicing. But only for a time. Only for a time. These things come and go, don't they? All these things come and go. But rejoicing, in this case, is rejoicing in the outcome. But what the Apostle's talking about, it's not rejoicing in the outcome. He says, rejoice in hope. Be rejoicing in hope. The hope we're talking about here is a different kind of hope, isn't it? You all know that. I'm sure I keep preaching to the converted, but we're talking about a sure and certain expectation, aren't we? It's not that vague hope. And the reason it's called hope, I believe, is because we can't actually see it. We haven't actually got it, not the fulfilment of it yet. It's hope in that sense. But it's not hope, it's not a vague hope, which may or may not happen. Although we can't see it. This is a hope which is substantiated, and it's substantiated by faith, what the Hebrews tells us. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We haven't seen it yet, we haven't got the fulfilment of it yet, but faith is the substance of it. We know by faith that it's a fact and that it will happen, because our hope is in a resurrected and living Saviour, isn't it? Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Because we can believe that Jesus Christ will do exactly as he said. You know, one of my favourite little bits of the Bible is uh, on the resurrection day when the ladies went to the, to the graveside and the angel or whoever it was at the grave said to them, he's not here, he's risen, I, just as he said. Just as he said, Jesus said, didn't he? he was going, what he was going to do, he said he was going to die, he said he was going to rise three days later, he said he was going to go back to be with his father, and he did exactly as he said. And he has said to us, you know, that he has gone to prepare a place for his followers. And he will come again to take us to be where he is. That's where our hope is. That's the hope. It's only a hope because we haven't seen it yet. We haven't received it yet. But it's not a vague hope. It's a certain hope. And we're to rejoice in it. You know, that's what we're to rejoice in. You know, we can rejoice in all kinds of things, can't we? Even in church life. And it's good. You know, we see people saved, converted. We see our ministry blessed. Rejoice. That's quite right. But those things too tend to come and go a little, you know. What did Jesus say to his followers when he sent them out two by two to minister in his day when he was on earth? And they came back and they were all excited because the demons had been subject to them. You know, he said to them, don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. He told them to rejoice in something else. What did he tell them to rejoice in? That your names are written in heaven. That's what we're to rejoice in. That is the hope in which we rejoice. Rejoice in hope. The outcome is yet to come, but we can still rejoice because the outcome is secure. We rejoice in hope. Christian joy is not circumstantial. It shouldn't be circumstantial. It so often is, and I'm as guilty of that as everyone else. We shouldn't be dependent on how this life is treating us because we're to rejoice in hope. The hope of what is yet to come. You know, I don't make light of circumstances. Circumstances can be tough. You know, we all go through different phases in our life, I think. But with God's help, it's possible to see beyond them, you know, to what lies ahead. You know, Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19, he said, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most miserable. Well, I don't know about you, I don't want to be of all men the most miserable. And I'm sure you don't want to be of all men and women and children the most miserable. You know, we're not meant to be miserable. We are not meant to be miserable Christians. Christianity is not a somber religion. Okay? That's a hope, a hopeful religion in which we can rejoice. But our hope has to be in Christ, not for this life only. You know, Christ is a great blessing. In this life, you know, I've had two halves in my life, basically. You know, I tried for the first 40 years to live without Christ. And it didn't work, okay? I can tell you that. And then, <coughs> at the age of 42 or 3, I came to Christ. And that didn't mean that all problems ended. You know, the problems still come and go. But now we have to face them with Christ. And I would much rather, I wouldn't be without Christ in this life. I don't know about any of you. Christ is a blessing in this life. 
but that is not the fulfillment of all the blessings. Okay? The hope is not in Christ for this life only. The main hope is yet to come. And that is what we're to rejoice in. You know, and in difficult times we need, in the words of the old hymn writer, don't we, to fix our eyes on Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And what happens? Things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Rejoicing is a duty for the Christian. He told the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. That sounds like an instruction. And in case they didn't get it the first time, what do you do? He told them again, rejoice. Rejoice. But what to rejoice in the Lord? Because he is our hope. He is our hope. Rejoice in hope. Rejoice in Jesus. Gee, the Christian life is a joyful life because it's hopeful. Because there is a certain reward and expectation that comes. Joyful because its end is certain. And it's the source, the only source of lasting joy there is. All other joys are temporary. But joy, the rejoicing in hope, the hope in which we rejoice, that's permanent. And we'll go on forever. We'll go on forever. Rejoice in hope, he says. Secondly, he tells us to be patient tribulation, or persevering, according to which uh, translation you're reading. I don't know if anybody here who's had a trouble-free life. I haven't. If you have, praise God. Praise God. But you know, trouble and suffering in this life is normal. It's normal. Jesus told us to expect it. He said in this life you will have tribulation. Simple. We will have tribulation. You know, in a general sense, we do live in a fallen world. You know, we share the effects of it, along with everyone else. We are in our own church, going through the book of Daniel. You know, I've been very struck how you know, Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, very devout believers, you know, faithful followers of the living God. But because of the failures of the Israelite people, they, with all the rest of them, had to go off into exile because they were faithful followers of God, didn't exempt them from the problems of the world. Okay, it doesn't exempt you and I from the natural problems of the world. We suffer from the effects of a fallen world. It's just the way it is. You know, and why do some suffer more than others? I can't answer you that. Only God knows that. But we all suffer to a degree. And as Christians, not only that, we can also suffer a little bit sometimes, not so much in this land as others, for our faith, although there may be difficulties, even in this land. And that shouldn't surprise us either, because we follow a saviour who is hated and despised. You know, and who told his followers they would be too. John 15. If the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. There's another source of tribulation sometimes for the Christian. Trouble is normal for everyone. And for the Christian as well. Paul says we're to be patient or persevering. We're to be patient in this tribulation. That's not a dour, stoical putting up with. You know, it's an active thing. It's a choice we can make. It's a choice we can and have to make. And again, I don't make life of troubles. You know, I know something about troubles. We all know something about troubles. They do drag us down. Whether they come in the form of anxiety or worry or physical pain. It, get, it can physically get you down and emotionally. And we can either let it, we can either let them overwhelm us, or with God's help, we can overcome it and come through it with that love intact. Because these things, you know, when we're drawn down by our troubles, whether it's physically or emotionally or anything else, it's very difficult to share your love with anyone else, isn't it? It's very difficult. And love is the heart, the beating heart of the Christian. It can drain our love for God, and it can drain our love for others. It can draw us away from the Lord. But here's something. Again, Paul in Romans 8, famous words. He says, we know that all things work together for good to those that love God, who are the call according to his purpose. Tribulation is not an exception. It may be hard, we may not understand it, but God is able to use it. He is able to use it. Again, famous words from James. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. I love that expression, fall into. That's how it happens, isn't it, sometimes with trouble. Sometimes trouble can be as a result of bad choices.
choices or decisions we've made, uh, things we've done, but oftentimes, you know, you just fall into them, don't you? Talking to our brother this morning, telling me about his accident. And uh, I was talking to Jane about this the other day, about falling into trouble, you know. I was reminded of, uh, when we were on holiday a few years ago, you know, we were there with my sister-in-law, brother-in-law, and we both got a dog, and the two dogs were running ahead of us on some open park land at a wonderful time. And they were just running on ahead, and suddenly they disappeared. So I went running up, a hundred yards or so away, see what had happened, and there was a pond level with the ground, walled all the way around, covered in green weed. They'd been running along, and suddenly they not realising what it was, straight in, you know, straight in, they were swinging around, and couldn't get out, covered in green weed, and we had to pull them out. But uh, that's how it is with trouble sometimes, you can be going along lovely, beautifully, everything's fine, suddenly something happens and you fall into trouble. Fall into trouble. James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Trouble's normal. I don't know why some people suffer a lot more troubles than others, but I do know that if we bring them to our Heavenly Father, He will, He can and will eventually work them together. We think we need also, it's very difficult, but to have a, a perspective of time on this because uh, it's all temporary, you see, it's all temporary. Even if it's a lifelong, it's still temporary, isn't it? I mean, we've got those famous words which you often trip off the tongue with God a thousand years or as a day, and a day is a thousand years. Well, it's true, you know, and that's how it will be for us one day as well, in eternity. You know, we will have unlimited time, unlimited time, free of pain and sickness and suffering and worry. John Newton wrote some great hymns, and uh, one of them he says, Though painful at present, it will cease before long, and then, oh, how pleasant a conqueror's song. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And it's famous, Amazing Grace hymn. Now, when I've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, no less days to sing God's praise. You know, this life is really but for a moment. It's really but for a moment. It's easy to say, I know, but it's true. It's true. Be patient in tribulation. The Lord will bring you through it. He will use it for your good. Thirdly, continue steadfastly in Prayer's hard work. Is prayer hard work? Does anyone find prayer easy? It takes effort, doesn't it? But you know, for the Christian, it's not optional. Again, quoting from old hymns, the hymn writer said, prayer is the Christian's vital breath. Vital breath. You can't live as a Christian without prayer. Paul's writings full of exhortations to pray is always saying, pray always, pray without ceasing, pray in the spirit, pray for me, pray for others, pray always, he said, is that possible, is it possible, pray always, <coughs> pray without ceasing, well there are many different ways of praying aren't there, many different ways of praying, we tend to think prayer only, as those perhaps times we set aside personally, or the times we set aside as a fellowship to come together. But really prayer in its most simplest form is communicating with our Father, isn't it? It's talking to our Father in heaven. You know? In its simplest form, that's what it is. Sometimes that's one to one with Him. Sometimes it's coming together as a family, you know, for a meeting. And sometimes it's a show for help, isn't it? You know, as a child might call his father if he's stuck in the mud or something, help! Come and drag me out, you know. Scripture is full of those kind of prayers too. I remember in one of the battles, I think it's in one of the Chronicles, they called out to the Lord in their distress, and he heard them. And Nehemiah, we can think of Nehemiah as he's going in to see the king to ask permission to go to Jerusalem. I said a prayer to his God, didn't he? On there, on the spot. So it's, a, it's a, an attitude of mind. It's to do, again, with relationship with our Father. You know, we need to be walking with him. 
And if we're walking with him, surely we will be talking with him. There are times when you're walking with anyone for companionable silence. Isn't it just enjoying each other's company? But there must be communication. It's all about relationship with our Father, isn't it? Continue steadfastly, Paul says. That sounds like there's some determination needed. Steadfastly. You know, the devil doesn't want us to be in relationship with our Father. He will try to disrupt our times of prayer. He will try to take away our joy. He will try to let the pain overcome us, our difficulties, whatever they may be, overcome us. We need to be steadfast in all these things. Steadfast in prayer. Continue steadfastly in prayer. So Paul talks to us here about how we should relate, first of all, to God. How we should relate, relate to each other as brothers and sisters. And then how we should relate to the world. But it all depends on our relationship, our personal relationship with God. That's where it all stands for. God. Jesus said when he was asked what was the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and your neighbour as yourself. And all the rest will come from there. Do you love the Lord with all your heart and mind and soul? You know, Jesus hates God. Jesus hated hypocrites. It's often described, isn't it, the Pharisees and scribes in, his, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, always calling them hypocrites. He did not like hypocrites. And a hypocrite, of course, is someone who says one thing, does another. You know, and I could come round and say to each one of you, and I can say to myself, do you love God? And you're going to say yes. But God knows our hearts. Is our heart right before God? Because only if we're in a re right relationship with God can we rejoice in this hope. And be patient in our tribulations and continue steadfastly in prayer. Only then can we be kindly affectionate to one another, giving preference to one another, giving generously to the poor, being empath empathetic with others in their situations and loving the world, even our enemies, only if we have that real love for God in our hearts. And to protect that love, we need to keep our eyes fixed on the hope that we can rejoice in that. We need to be guarding in tribulation, always looking to Jesus to make help us to be patient through tribulation. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, prayer. Communication with our Heavenly Father. Continue steadfastly in prayer. It's kind of a spiritual health check in a sense. You can go through all these things afterwards because these are the traits of the Christian who's walking closely with Jesus. And perhaps check ourselves. Are we living a Christian life? Are we, are we being good witness for the family of God. You know, family name is very important to God. He does a lot of things for his name's sake. If you read the Bible, reading through the Bible, for his name's sake. The fact of his name. We take the name of Jesus when we become followers of Christ. We're Christians, aren't we? Christians. And these things are a witness to the world. Jesus himself said it. People will know you're my disciples if you love one another. And we can only love one another. We have a genuine and real love for God. So I just want to encourage you this morning to keep rejoicing in hope. Not a vague hope, it's a sure and certain one. May God help you to be patient through tribulation. But continue steadfastly in prayer. Which is the powerhouse, perhaps, of all these things. It's often called the powerhouse of the church, the prayer meeting, isn't it? And I think the prayer life is the powerhouse of each individual Christian. Continue steadfastly. It's hard work in prayer. May God help us all to be worthy um, of the name of Christian with his help by his Holy Spirit. Let's close by singing our last hymn, which is number 586. It reminds us what our hope is built on. Nothing less than Jesus.
Jesus, blood and righteousness. 586. Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and always.